Welcome back, Earth scientists, and we are here to learn about air masses and weather today. Looking at that image, what comes to mind? What caused such a massive problem right there? What kind of weather system could do such a thing? Well, we're going to investigate that today. Water changes states of energy, and that helps drive weather patterns. So we're going to look at how water changes from liquid to solid to vapor, vice versa. And interestingly enough, the energy that's released is important because how it's released or how it's absorbed can dictate instability of an air mass, in which in turn can produce weather. Heat is actually measured in calories just like what you would eat. So one calorie of heat is necessary to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now there's something called latent heat. We'll be getting to that a little later in our lessons about weather. This is stored or hidden heat which is not derived from temperature change. Very important in things like uh, hurricane formation. So the changes of the state of water basically go, if you go from a solid to a gas, we call that sublimation. Notice that it absorbs 680 calories, so heat's pulled in at that point. If you go from a gas to a solid, you release heat in 680 calories. All right, let's go from a solid to a liquid. Now we absorb 80 calories, but when we, in, we evaporate liquid, we absorb it for 600 calories as a gas. When a gas is condensed back into water, heat is released at 600 calories. Heat is released to freezing at 800 calories. What does this basically mean? It means as we go back and forth between the different states of water, we're releasing and we're absorbing heat which means we have unstable air conditions. To change the state of water, heat must be absorbed or released, and so liquid is changed to gas during evaporation, and during condensation, vapor is changed into a liquid. So 600 calories per gram of water are added when we have vaporization, and that's called latent heat of vaporization. So that would be the evaporation process right here, where you are actually, um, gaining heat because you are moving that heat energy has moved from a liquid to a gas. Condensation turns it back into a, listed, a liquid, so a gas back into a liquid. That's called latent heat of condensation. Remember latent heat of condensation is important hidden heat for things like hurricanes. Now melting, when you have that occur, so you have a solid uh, water in the form of ice melting into a liquid, you're going to gain some heat, 80 calories of water are added, and that's called latent heat of melting. In freezing, you have heat that's actually released out of the water process, and 80 calories is released. That's called latent heat of fusion. When you're looking at sublimation, this is the solid change directly into a gas, so ice cubes shrinking in the freezer would be a great example of this happening, and you're going to actually absorb heat in 680 calories worth. Deposition is when a vapor changes back into a solid, so that would be like frost in your freezer or a compartment where water has turned from a um, gas back into a solid and heat gets released back into the form of 680 calories. Now we measure humidity based on the amount of uh, saturated air that's in an air mass and we do that based on a percentage. So you'll hear about relative humidity, it's 80%, it's 10%, it's 100%. Essentially uh, saturated air, stuff that's full of water, is considered 100% relative humidity. Now we change relative humidity in one of two ways. One, we add or subtract moisture from the air, and uh, we can add it by raising the relative humidity, and we can remove moisture by lowering the relative humidity. Relative humidity can be changed in two ways. When we change the air temperature, the lowering of the temperature raises the relative humidity. 
So at dew point temperature, that's the temperature in which a parcel of air would need to cool to reach saturation. Essentially, you would have some sort of precipitation occur at that time. So when you're looking at these different um, relative humidity changes, I kind of just want you to focus on, we notice we have a constant temperature right here, 25 degrees Celsius. And then I want you to take a look at the vapor and notice that the water vapor is increasing. And as the water vapor increases, even though we have the capacity is the same, uh, notice that the relative humidity went from 25%. When we had 5 grams of water vapor, it went up to at 10 grams of water vapor up to 50%. And at 20 grams of water vapor at the same temperature, 100%. So um, relative humidity is basically going to be boiling down to two things, temperature and capacity of the water content of water vapor. Now we measure relative humidity uh, by looking at several things. One of the first things that happens is that we can look at temperature. The dew point temperature is where the air is cooled below dew point and that causes some form of condensation or precipitation for that matter. But condensation that you would recognize would be dew, fog, cloud formation. Water vapor does require some kind of surface to condense on which is called a condensation nuclei. We use a device that looks like this, a psychrometer, in order to measure relative humidity. There's other ways you can measure relative humidity with today's more formal um, technology, but this was the old-fashioned hand version of how we used to measure relative humidity. Adiabatic temperature changes are uh, very important to certain areas of the world, and we're going to talk about one in just a minute. When air is compressed or it expands, that can change the temperature that occurs in, a, in an air mass. So if air is compressed, motion of air molecules increase and the air will warm. In descending air is compressed due to increasing air pressure, because air pressure is simply a measure of how much weight that air mass has against the surface of the earth. As an air expands, the parcel does work on the sur uh, surrounding air and the air begins to cool, and the rising air expands due to de decreasing air pressure. So dry adiabatic uh, air mass rates uh, deal with unsaturated air. So as air expands and rises, it cools at one degree per every 100 meters. So let's put that in something you would relate to. 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. That'll be a test question. Let me tell you why. You can decide to go hiking at the Grand, uh, Grand Canyon <clears throat> and you're going to start up at the rim. Say you get really industrious and want to go rim to rim. Well, there's over a mile of vertical change that you'll be hiking through. So if a mile is um, certainly over a thousand feet, over two thousand feet, so you could tell me that your temperature would change every thousand feet with that dry air. You would be going getting hotter as you went to the bottom of the canyon. So let's say they flew you down to the bottom of the canyon and you decided to walk up. As you reach to the top of the canyon, it should be considerably cooler. Every thousand feet you go up, it's going to get 5.5 degrees cooler. Every time you go down in elevation, it should get 5.5 degrees hotter. That's for dry, unsaturated air. Descending air, as it compresses and warms, it's, a th it's one degree for every hundred meters. So wet adiabatic lapse rates are a little bit different. They vary from rates of 0.5 degrees Celsius to 0.9 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. And it has to do with the heat released by the condensing water, which reduces the amount of cooling that can occur in the air. So condensation is occurring and latent heat is being liberated or released. And eventually the air reaches its due uh, point. When that happens, rain will typically occur. So let's take a look at this phenomena. I went to Death Valley and uh, on my sabbatical, and I can tell you, it, most of it's below sea level, by the way. So here's Los Angeles, sits at exactly the same um, elevation as Death Valley. And Los Angeles has 3 million people. Death Valley has 6 to 11 people, depending on any given day that are living there, not including visitors. 
So let's take a look at lapse rates and let's show you how adiabatic lapse rates work. So you've got Los Angeles receiving uh, sea breezes and those sea breezes are going to start to go up the San Bernardino Mountains right here. So as they go up in elevation, let's think about this, it'll be a change in the wet adiabatic lapse rate of 3.5 degrees for every thousand feet. So it's going to get cooler and eventually we're going to go up 10,000 feet to the top of the mountains. So Los Angeles started off at 90 degrees at the shoreline, okay, right where the sea is. And by the time we reach up that 10,000 feet, we would have gone up 10 times. So you should see a dramatic decrease in the temperature at the top of the mountain. So 3.5 times 10, which is 1,000 um 10 into 10,000 is a, you know, uh, or at the uh, 10,000 divided by 1,000 feet is 10. And so that's going to give you 35 degrees. So you take 90 degrees minus 35 degrees, and that gives you a 55 degree temperature mark at the top of the mountain. So it seems like it should be the same going back down the other side of the mountain, not the case. So Going down the back side of the mountain, we got a rain shadow effect right here, and that's going to cause dry air masses to be on this side of the mountain. Instead, every time we go down 1,000 feet, we should increase by 5.5 degrees for every 1,000 feet. So we're still got to go down 10,000 feet and even a little bit more when you consider most of Death Valley is slightly below sea level. So 5.5 times 10 Remember, the 10 comes from the 10,000 feet divided by 1,000 equals 55. So 55 degrees here plus 55, what does that give you? That gives you 110 degree temperature at the bottom of Death Valley. When I was there this summer, it got up to 126 degrees, an unusually hot uh, circumstance for that area. A big spread, even though they're at the same uh, elevation, and there's just a mountain blocking them. So you got a rain shadow desert on this side and the dry, ad dry adiabatic lapse rate makes a difference. So this is what uh, Death Valley looks like. And it really is quite interesting because uh, it truly does sit way below sea level. When you go through Death Valley, you're going through the road that you see in this picture right here. And I was really quite stunned to see people riding uh, bikes and training, uh, running for their marathon part of a triathlon that occurs there. There's a couple of famous signs. This is one of them right here. And that's the below sea level sign as you go through the park. When you get there, uh, really, uh, you're looking at Los Angeles and you're looking at Death Valley. They both receive the same amount of sunlight. The difference is Death Valley is a rain shadow desert, and it's extremely hot, much hotter than you would see otherwise. What is absolute stability? This is the ability of air masses to cool as they rise in the environment. Remember, we have that wet and that dry adiabatic lapse rate. So eventually, the environmental lapse rate is going to end up being about 5 degrees for every 1,000 meters as air moves up in uh, meters up into the atmosphere. So there are different types of air masses. There's stable air masses and then absolutely instable air masses. So let's look at stable air. This often uh, involves widespread clouds with very little vertical thickness. Uh, precipitation is very uh, light, if any, so a high air mass or high air pressure system would produce a stable air mass. Instability or absolute instability acts like a hot air balloon. As hot air rises, it's warmer than the surrounding air. The less dense air around the surrounding air is unstable, then it continues to rise until it reaches an altitude with the same temperature. So what we're going to end up having is a little bit higher environmental lapse rate, then uh, it'll be 12 degrees centigrade for every thousand feet, which makes a very high potential for unstable air masses and vertical development of thunderstorms. So that brings me into moisture clouds and precipitations. As we go through uh, the process of understanding the different forms of condensation and understanding that weather is a direct relate relationship to how moisture changes and water vapor in the atmosphere and temperature changes related to the adiabatic lapse rate, 
then we can understand what's going on with how clouds form. Now, clouds require something to condense on. There's basically three things a cloud needs to form. It needs moisture. It needs a um, condensation nuclei, which is something like dust or smoke or salt that might be in the air. And third, you need some kind of moisture. So you got to have those three things, dew point, moisture, and then some form of condensation nuclei. So when a water vapor in the air changes to a liquid and forms dew, fog, or clouds, we call that condensation. Water, ver uh, water vapor must have something to connect to, to touch on. So possible condensation surfaces on the ground can be anything from grass to windows to a pipe to a car, um, you know, if you were outside, your skin. But outside in nature where you're just talking about air mass, it's going to have to be something that's solid and usually very fine grained to be aloft in the atmosphere. So that would be something like, uh, condi like a, a little amount of dust. For an FYI, that's why we regulate dust or emissions that are black city material that are coming out of stacks and out of the tailpipes of vehicles because uh, that's one of the things they produce besides things like NOx gases, which is nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. They also release that black city stuff, which can be condensation nuclei. Now, clouds are made up of little bitty minute water molecules and millions and millions of them. To be honest, they're little tiny crystals of ice that have accumulated. You probably, as a child on your first airplane ride, if you've ever taken one, wondered, I wonder if we're going to crash when we hit that cloud. I mean, just about everybody thinks that their first time through. But um, these are very, very thin uh, clouds, and you can go right through them. Basically, there's three categories of clouds. There are cirrus, cumulus, and stratus, and there's a combination of each of these. So we're going to go through the different types of clouds and talk about the weather patterns that should be associated with each one. Cirrus clouds are what you're seeing way up here. They're very thin, feathery-like. Uh, they're white. They're associated with high pressure. Cumulus look like little uh, cotton balls, but there's a type of cumulus that doesn't look like a cotton ball that looks like a very mean, ugly thunder cloud. Most little cumulus clouds like you see right here are associated with happy weather, fair weather. Stratus clouds are sheets or layers that cover much of the sky, usually associated with dreary, not so happy, uh, rainy weather. Those are classic cirrus clouds. Notice how thin and feathery they are. You would not expect to have an ugly rain day out of this or a bad weather day. These would be beautiful skies, fair, gorgeous weather. Stratus clouds, you've probably seen these right here at home. Yes, when we have bad storm days and they're very lengthy, lots of rain. Typically, this is what they look like when it rains all day long. Stratus are like blankets, sheets, and that's how I always remembered it, S for S, sheets for stratus. Cumulus clouds are the fair weather clouds. These are little baby uh, uh, cotton balls that are in the sky. And uh, these can actually become very ugly storms very quickly if they're given a chance to have unstable heating of the atmosphere, usually typically late in the afternoon. So clouds are classified based on their height. And uh, there's high clouds, middle clouds, and low clouds. So let's take a look at high clouds first. These are anything above 6,000 meters. Uh, so that's going to be 18,000 feet or higher. That's cirrus, cirrus stratus, and cirrus cumulus. I told you there was a combination of each of these. Middle clouds are from 2,000 meters to 6,000 meters. So it's going to be about 6,000 feet to 18,000 feet. And these are alto stratus. Alto means middle and alto cumulus. And then low clouds are anything up from the ground level up to about 6,000 feet. And these are stratus, stratus cumulus, and nimbus stratus. So when clouds form, they form also at different layers and different heights. So we look at the height to tell you a little bit about the type of uh, weather pattern that you're going to have. Clouds of vertical development form from low to high latitude. That is a cumulus nimbus right here. And they produce bad thunderstorms. So if you get a cumulus nimbus, bad news. 
So here we go. You got high clouds way up here. These should not be producing big weather patterns. Alto cumulus, and then this is where you're going to have your bad weather right here in this area. So you're looking at this particular spot right here and you're going, okay, I see some variety of different clouds, but most of these are pretty low lying clouds and I would say we're probably having a storm on this particular day. If you're taking a look at the clouds in the background, notice how low to the ground that they are. Those would be storm producing low uh, level clouds. So what type of clouds are these and what type of weather would you expect to see with these? If you answered cumulus, you are correct. By the way, this is Zion National Park, and I believe this is a great place to take a, a break, and we'll see you back for the second half of Air Masses. Bye. Welcome back, Earth scientists. Let's just have a review of what you learned about clouds. Remember, real fair weather clouds are going to be stuff like these cirrus clouds, a little bit of cirrus stratus, and little bitty cumulus clouds down here. But the stratocumulus and the big strato clouds and certainly your cumulus nimbus clouds are going to be the ones that are weather producers, bad weather producers. So let's talk about frontal boundaries today. These are air masses that uh, separate from one another based on their mass and their density. And each air mass has a unique signature pattern or identity. Uh, warmer, less dense air gets forced upwards into the atmosphere. The cooler, denser air obviously kind of almost acts as a doorstop or a wedge to keep those uh, warmer air fronts from coming in. So let's start with a warm air front, describe what they are, and then we're going to talk about uh, how they're shown on a weather map. A warm front, uh, when warm air replaces cooler air, it's shown on a map with semicircles and they're very distinctive uh, lines that you have in uh, meteorology. When you look at a weather station and see a weather map starting today, I want you to look at that. That's one of your assignments tonight is to evaluate what was going on with uh, frontal systems. So you're going to see clouds become lower as the, the front nears and uh, there's light to moderate precipitation because it doesn't advance very quickly. Here's what those little semicircles are. It's done with a red line and it's this way on every weather map with the little semicircles facing the direction of the front that's coming in. So behind it you'll have uh, some weather patterns and you'll probably generate some wind and some uh, rain but not as substantial as you would if you had a dramatic temperature shift. Cold fronts replace warm air and they're drawn on a line with uh, blue triangles. They advance faster than warm fronts and they are definitely associated with more violent weather than a warm front. You usually have uh, shorter durations of precipitation but they're much more intense. So the cold air mass, um, the weather behind the front, gets dominated by this cold air mass. It's going to have a high pressure system and you'll have a clearer weather condition. So when you have high pressure, you have to imagine that's an air mass weighs a lot. So it's pushing down on the earth and it kind of pushes out the bad weather. With a low pressure system, the opposite is true. The weather, uh, the low pressure is not as heavy, so the air can kind of rise and get unequal heating of the atmosphere, leading to uh, unusual weather patterns. So this is what a cold front would be drawn like right here, a blue line with triangles, and it's showing you the direction of the movement of the air mass. And you should be seeing some pretty ugly weather right at the boundary of a cold front. Sometimes we get what are called stationary fronts. These are where the flow of air on both sides of the front is almost parallel to the line of the front itself and the surface position of the front does not move so it just kind of uh, sits in one location. In that case you're going to actually draw uh, your cold and warm uh, symbols so you'll have the side that has the cold front uh, the direction that it's moving you'll see the little triangles and then you'll see the warm front on the other side where the two meet. So this tells you that you've got a stationary front. An occluded front is where an active cold front overtakes a warm front and the cold air wedges up against the warm air and this is where you get some really, really crazy weather, even more so than you would with a stationary front. 
So what happens is precipitation that's associated with warm air gets forced aloft, and so now you can cool that air mass off that's typically pretty moist and end up with some interesting weather. So here's how a formation of an occluded front could occur. You get the cold front coming in from one side, the warm coming in from another, but the cold actually pushes into the uh, warm, and what happens is that makes sudden cooling of that warm, moist air, makes it hit it hits at dew point and you'll actually produce some pretty heavy thunderstorms and clouds that produce quite a bit of rain. So let's talk about some different types of uh, air masses that you might see. Fog is an can be very devastating. I was driving into work this morning, as a matter of fact, and there was some very heavy fog and some dense fog warnings on the news. Form fogs because of radiation cooling of the ground, and typically there's a movement of cooler air above, um, or should I say uh, movement of air. The air itself could actually be warmer than a cooler surface. So at night in particular, early in the night mornings before sunrise, the ground has cooled off, but that air mass is hovering over this particular uh colder mass and it's still warm and so you get some unequal heating and you produce condensation in the form of fog. There are many different types of fog um, and from now on I hope you'll look at out your windows when you're driving around and look and see what kind of fog you have. There's an advection fog which is a warm moist air that moves over a cool ground like the surface right here. A radiation fog where the Earth's surface cools rapidly during calm, nice, clear, cool nights. An upslope fog where humid air moves up a slope because of adiabatic cooling rates. Then you get a steam fog where cool air moves over warm water. I bet all of you have seen this over a lake or over a river or a stream. So the water appears to be steaming when it's really not. It's simply just an evaporation type of fog that's called a steam fog. A frontal fog or a precipitation fog forms during a system of a front where the wedged air, uh, the warm air, lifts over the colder air and the rain evaporates to form a fog type structure. Precipitation actually has different types of terms as well. You're like, well, I just thought rain was rain as rain is always rain. Well, it's not exactly that way. They're actually measured in milliliter, uh, millimeters. Excuse me. Uh, dirt's done the same way. If you ever wondered about dirts and rocks, they're actually measured by millimeter uh, diameter, and that's what we're going to be looking at here. So uh, rain and drizzle are two very different things. Rain actually has a droplet that is at least 0.5 millimeters in diameter and can be much larger. So there's different uh, qualifications of rain. This is actually the chart that you would look at. A light rain is 0.1 inch or less in an hour. A moderate rain would be 0.11 to 0.3 inches per hour. And then a heavy rain is anything greater than 0.3 inches of an hour. So when you start looking at raindrops, uh, we start getting different sizes, and that dictates about what type of level rain you're going to have. A drizzle are droplets that are less than 0.5 milli uh, millimeters in diameter. And we've all experienced a drizzle if you live in any place that gets rain. And that's a very tiny amount of small little bitty drops that are coming down. Snow is ice crystals and aggregates of ice crystals that have formed and they actually have a, a systematic shape and pattern. Sleet and glaze are very different from snow. Sleet occurs uh, when you have small particles of ice that actually come down to the ground but they're not made into a snow particle and have definitive patterns like snow does. So when you see glaze, that's uh, freezing rain. Unfortunately, where uh, Texas is, this is sometimes what we get in Waco, Texas, is glaze, where the ground will freeze over with rain and creates a sheet of this ice. Extremely dangerous. Um, sleet would be a better choice to have to endure than glaze. But when you get glaze, um, it's slippy, slidey stuff like you see right here in this picture. Hail. Uh, these are... 
forms of precipitation that actually have a shape that has layers. And so if you ever get a chance to pick up some hail balls, you need to look at them, cut them in half if you're able to do so, and see the layering that affects. Can you see the hail on the ground there? Uh, most of these range from one to five centimeters, but the reality check is that precipitation can get up to softball in uh, larger sizes. That's extremely dangerous condition when hail gets that large. You're only going to see hail form in cumulus nimbus settings where you get a severe thunderstorm, where you get violent up and down drafts of energy, allowing for those balls to gain size and layers as they go up through the cloud and back down. So the more times it's had to rotate, rotate through those tall anvil or cumulus nimbus clouds, the uh, more chance it's going to have to be larger in size. So hopefully you've just gotten small pellets and not had severe damage from precipitation in the form of hail. I've actually had a car total from softball size hail. Now, rime is probably one of the prettiest forms of frozen precipitation, and uh, this is what forms on uh, cold surfaces like trees and sometimes even power lines. But this image right here of rime on trees is super cooled fog or cloud droplets that have actually accreted onto a hard surface and frozen. So rime is absolutely beautiful. When we measure precipitation, we typically use what's called a standard rain gauge. This is actually something you should probably pick up, and they can be very cheap, sometimes free. Um, and they help us determine how much rain an area has received. In one storm, an area in one neighborhood may receive uh, a substantial amount of rain, where the adjacent neighborhood may receive virtually none. Uh, same thing with cities, and so we need to use a rain gauge to determine exactly how much rain has fallen in an area. That's important for a number of reasons. Uh, I can think of one that may surprise you from an environmental point of view. Uh, one half inch of rain with runoff or more qualifies as a qualifying rain event for stormwater regulations. So if you've had that amount of rain, you have to get out and uh, look at your facility if you're regulated for industrial or construction stormwater permitting. So this is the standard rain gauge, what it looks like. There's some fancy dancy ones you can get that kind of do the work for you, but no, stain, uh, no rain gauge is going to work right if you don't empty it out and read it. So you have to actually go in and look at your rain gauge after a rain event and, and write that uh, measurement down. Another way that we measure precipitation is in frozen precipitation, completely different than measuring rain. The general ratio of frozen snow is 10 snow units to one water unit. This can vary widely based on the density of the snow, the compaction of the snow, and so forth. So uh, radar is the most dependable source about how much snow is going to fall, but if you get a foot of snow, or let's say 10 inches of snow, really that's going to, when it melts, equates down to one inch of water. So I'm going to see you back soon for air pressure and wind and looking forward to seeing you at the next lecture. Bye.